thanks for having me here. When Tom said if I you know, was interested in giving a talk to the Pacific Science Center, I thought, well, it'll be at the Pacific Science Center. Then he said, well, it's at a bar. And then he said, <laughs> e it's on the same night as the uh, national championship football game. I thought, <coughs> well, <laughs> it's a good thing uh, Oregon's playing and not Washington. But anyway, I'm glad to be here and share some uh, thoughts with you about crows and ravens tonight. Um, I wanted to keep it informal, and that's why we don't have any PowerPoint, so it's a little it's insecure for me not to have my slides up there to refer to. But uh, anyway, what I want to do is um, review a little bit about the basic crow and human relationship. And my uh, colleague and co-author and friend Tony Angel and I have developed a lot of these ideas together, and we continue to develop them. But the basic uh, is this, just to put it into big perspective for you, and that is uh, crows, and especially crows, ravens, and people, we think have co-evolved over the millennia. And we think this from a variety of different perspectives, not just uh, us affecting the biological evolution of crows by perhaps adding food or challenging them with our um, attempt to keep them out of our farm fields and things like that, but also by their influence on our culture and our influence back on their culture, which by culture in an animal, I mean just socially learned traditions. So we think it's, it's an interesting way to view this animal. It's not just a static part of our environment, but it's one that's interacting with us and shaping us quite literally uh, and has been shaping us quite literally for millennia. Bars, just to, since we're at a bar, um, bars in, in Europe, Ireland certainly, uh, maybe a couple of centuries ago would always have a raven that lived at the bar to, get to catch the rats and mice that were in the grain stalks that they used to brew the beer. And so many, you'll see many uh, breweries that have ravens associated with their labels or their names, and I'm thinking of one on the east side of the mountains right now uh, that would do that. And that's because of this, uh, this use, basically, almost domestication of these animals for, for purposes that we've had. But they still remain wild, and they, uh, they influence us spiritually and in our language, in our art, many different ways influence us strongly uh, today just as much as they have uh, in the past, especially here in the Northwest where they've influenced our uh, Native American culture for um, millennia and quite strongly. So anyway, we think uh, of crows. If we, if we think of crows and ravens, I'll, I'll use the both – both of them kind of interchangeably. I mean, I work on both species here, mostly crows because they're here in the city living with us. But when I talk about the influence of these animals on us and us on them, it's really both species or a group of species together. But if we just focus on the crow that you're familiar with here in the Seattle area most now, that's really a winner of an animal. It's one that survives with us, that thrives on the resources we provide, and the way we change the environment here. So we take what was a dark, wet forest and cut it up into small pieces, put lawns and things in garbage dumps and things like that in between those chunks of forest and make a perfect place for the crows to nest in the trees and to feed on our lawns and dumps and road-killed animals that cross the road in front of our cars. So we've transformed the landscape here in a way that's very beneficial for the crow. And that's why their numbers have increased and they're doing quite well here, unlike a lot of birds which are declining. And people often ask, well, isn't it the reason these other birds are declining is because the crow is increasing and eating them all? Well, crows do eat other birds. They especially eat young robins and the eggs of robins. But there's an awful lot of robins around, if you, if you haven't noticed. And so really, I don't think there's that tight of a cause and effect relationship. We've studied it a lot. We've tried to understand it, but most of the reason that crows are increasing is because of us, and most of the reason the other animals, the other birds are decreasing is because of us, because we've removed the forest that they use to breed in. So really, we're having the effect on both of these species, and it's more of a correlation than it is a causation of, of crows driving other species to extinction. They do affect other species. Ravens do often affect other species on our coasts, plovers that nest on the coast or tortoises that, that live in the desert. So they, they do have effects that are negative on other species. They are a predator and a scavenger, but they also respond directly to the sorts of things we do that do to the environment that benefit them and also um, cause the detriment of other species. 
So anyway, their success is costly to others. For example, robins and perhaps even farmers, if you want to think of it that way. They rob crops uh, from time to time. They also provide some beneficial services of removing uh, harmful insects from those crops, but they are a pest in many different situations. And it's, so it's this positive effect um, on, on our culture that motivates a lot of us to be interested and captivated by these animals. And on the other hand, there's this negative effect with other people that see them as a direct threat for their livelihood. And it's this positive and negative strong influence they've had on people, one way or the other, rarely neutral, but one way or the other, that's really, I think, shaped their biology and our culture to a large extent. So that's kind of the general picture. Increasing crows and ravens, having negative effects on some people, stimulating wonder and fascination in other people. And this has been an ongoing back and forth sort of relationship, much like the uh, flowers and hummingbirds have a relationship that shape one another's, um, the flowers corolla in color perhaps, and the hummingbirds bill. Crows and ravens and people have shaped one another in very similar sorts of ways. Okay, so that's the big picture for you. Next, I wanted to talk about a few current fascinations. I mean, I, I'm one that, that enjoys crows. I, I like observing them and seeing them and learning from them. Same thing with ravens. Um, I can understand their negative effects and their the reason people don't like them in many ways, but I, I find them fascinating and, and challenging to understand. And so Tom mentioned this video of the murder of crows. In, in that video, we we show a lot of what we're doing to try to understand one of the ways these animals have been so successful with us. And that is they personally recognize and respond to individual people in their environment. People that are nice to them, that throw peanuts as they walk around uh, the city, uh, that don't chase them, that perhaps invite them into their yard to, to nest there. Those people are recognized and they're followed. Is there, is there anybody in this audience like that? A few. So these people are recognized out of a crowd and they are followed every day. They have a probably a fairly predictable pattern and the birds know this and they know their faces and they will pick them out of a crowd and come walking after them, flying in front of them, squawking in particular ways to try to get entice them to, to feed them and to continue this positive interaction they have with them. So we studied this uh, on campus. We always knew that bird, that they were responding to us personally, but it was not from a positive standpoint. Because when we study the bird, we need to catch it often. And we need to tag it so we can identify it later and follow it it's through its life, see who it breeds with, how many young it has, that sort of thing. That's the kind of raw data that we have to gather. And to do that, we have to catch the birds. And to catch them, it's not so nice to the bird all the time. We, we put food down, maybe a nice pile of Cheetos, for example, one of their favorite foods. They'll come in to feed on the Cheetos, and we shoot a net over the top of them doesn't hurt them, but it, it secures them to the ground. We run up, we grab them, we put them in a sock to keep them calm and from struggling, and we put bands or a radio transmitter on them and let them go. So we hassle them for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and of course, it doesn't seem like much to us, but I'm sure it's a big thing to those birds. And we always saw when we'd go back and try to watch them, they were paying attention to us, and they were acting a little differently to us than they were to our friends that hadn't done such heinous things to the birds. <coughs> they would they would scold us, they would make vocalizations, and, and they would be very wary. They would try to fool us. We'd, we'd be watching, I remember one time watching a bird carry sticks to its nest, because we were always trying to find their nest. And it was flying through this one spot on the tree, and I marked it on my map, okay, that's where the nest is. Came back, everybody, yep, still carrying sticks up there, no problem. The nest didn't seem to be getting much bigger, though. <laughs> so it was just carrying these sticks up there when I was watching, and when I wasn't, it was building a nest in a different tree. <laughs> just you know, to make life interesting. So we use these masks, you may, have, you may have seen this, but we use masks to try to understand if, we, if it was the same face, but entirely different people. Any of you in this room could wear the mask that we caught the birds with. Would they then respond as an enemy, would, as they would respond to an enemy if they saw this same face? Different person, different clothes, different walk, all sorts of everything else changed except the face, and they did. Uh, when we'd go out with that face that we caught them on, they would immediately scold. They would uh, fly down and chase us. They would give these harsh vocalizations, which would attract other crows in to try to move us out of the area. 
You've probably seen them do this to eagles and other sorts of predators in their environment. That's their, that's their shtick. Bring in others, chase the predator out, let the predator know that surprise is no longer on their side, and we can move you out of here, and you're not going to have good hunting success here. So just leave and leave us alone. And that's what they would do to us. And if we wore a different mask, one that we didn't catch them with, they wouldn't do that. Occasionally, but not very often would they do that. They, were, they seemed very, very precise in learning which uh, person, which face in this case, had been mean to them. But I think we could do the exact same thing with uh, feeding them and trying to get them to – trying to be nice to them. In fact, we tried that to start with, and it was just taking longer. The interesting thing to us is that we only caught these birds one time, and, and now it's four years later on campus, and they still respond to us in a negative way. And what's even more interesting is that we only caught seven birds on our campus, and when you walk out now, there's 30 or 40 birds that often will uh, give you hell, basically, <coughs> for walking around. So they have learned from watching one another respond to us that there is a bad face out there, and they've accumulated this knowledge this is, a, this is the sort of thing I talk, talk about with respect to a culture or a tradition of knowledge in this community of birds. They now know our particular, this caveman face we wear on campus is dangerous, and you, know, you can wear that face anyplace else, and crows don't care at all about it. But there, where they've got this tradition of scolding and hating this individual face, uh, they've passed that on to their peers and their offspring, and they, um, that tradition is spread in the community. So just uh, one other update on that. I spent this morning scanning the brain of a bird who we've also um, – we've done these same experiments with. We caught them with one face, and now we are exposing them in a laboratory situation on campus to the face we caught them with and a face we've been feeding them with, two different masks. And we're scanning their brains after they see us for 15 minutes and respond to seeing this particular face. And I can only tell you that the pattern of activity in their brain is different with a sample size of one on each. It's different when they see the face that we've been feeding them with versus the face that we caught them with. And I can only hope that that'll be consistent the next few trials. But that's kind of the next step of that is trying to understand what part of the brain is it. Mammals have a particular place in their brain called the amygdala that is used to recognize uh, fearful situations and remember those fearful memories. And birds have the same sort of um, brain structure and we're interested in whether it's also used for these sorts of tasks. Okay, another interesting um, fascination is their ability to talk. Many people have, have heard, I've heard crows and ravens talk. These are usually pets that people have had, and they uh, pick up human voice just because as a songbird, they have one of, they're one of five different animal groups that actually learns their vocalization. Most animals don't. They're born with them uh, fairly innate, but songbirds Humans, whales, a few other things uh, learn vocalizations with experience. And so crows and ravens can learn to talk. And uh, I see a, um, my Montana grizzly T-shirt out here. In, in Missoula, Montana, in the 1960s, there was a crow that uh, learned to call dogs. And this guy, Kevin Smith, called me up one time and he said, John, I've uh, got a great story for you. I woke up one morning to my dog barking like crazy out in the backyard, and I went out there to sh tell my dog to shut up. It was early in the morning, and it was making too much noise. And as I yelled to be quiet, the dog kept barking, and so did the person who was whistling to the dog. Here, boy, here, boy. <coughs> come on, come on. What's up? <laughs> and so he walks out in his backyard, and up from the kennel pops a crow calling to the dog, whistling, hey, boy, hey, boy, let's go. <coughs> and the dog's going nuts trying to get this guy. Kevin uh, assures me he wasn't drinking too heavily that evening, <laughs> uh, not that morning at all, and uh, that, in fact, the bird then went to the University of Montana campus, spent several weeks there calling dogs. And what he'd do is he'd fly around Missoula, and he'd gather up dogs, bring them to the Oval on campus, and he'd sit up in a tree. <laughs> and the dogs would gather underneath him as he called, and he'd have 10 or 12 dogs barking <laughs> at the tree. And he'd wait until the crow would wait until the class bells rang and students piled out into the oval, started crossing between to go to classes, then the crow would take off and he'd fly low to the ground with all the dogs chasing <laughs> after him, right through all of the people, making quite a uh, ruckus, maybe lodging, dislodging a sandwich or a bag of Cheetos in the process, I don't know. So they use voice, they learn voice, that's not so surprising, but then they tend to use it in these appropriate situations, which is pretty fascinating. 
Another example like that is uh, play. Many of you have seen, um, seen these birds play. There's lots of videos on the internet of them playing with toys. They will, uh, people who've raised crows or ravens or magpies, uh, these birds will fetch balls and bring them back. They'll sit on their back and throw a ball in the air and catch it and play with this for hours, like a parrot. Any of you have parrots that, that play with toys in your cage? Yeah, so these guys are very playful. They have large brains. They have the same reward system in their brain that we do for play. Uh, when they engage in activities like that, uh, opioids, natural endorphins in their brain are released. They, they bond with, other, with neurons in their brain, and that gives them the sense of pleasure. Just like when we uh, have morphine at the, you know, for a surgery or something like that uh, that blocks pain and, and difficulty that we're having, uh, the same sorts of natural chemicals do that for a bird that's playing. So they get some uh, natural high off of doing that, or they have fun, you could call it. So an, as another example of play in ravens, again, a um, person uh, sent me a bit of information, this one from Rocky Mountain National Park, and what these folks had seen were ravens surfing. And so as they describe it, there was eight ravens, seven or eight, don't have an exact count, seven or eight ravens, which love to play in the wind. And, and ravens are playful. They'll slide down slow uh, snow slopes and roll down snow and do all sorts of interesting things in the wind or on slippery surfaces. But these birds did, took it one step further. They got surfboards, which were about six inch long pieces of bark, curled bark, like would be on the branch of a tree, maybe this big around, curled pieces of bark. They gripped these things in their feet and they would use them to basically surf on an updraft coming up off of a overlook in Rocky Mountain National Park. And they would, and that's, to me, it wasn't surprising. I mean, I think they could do it without the wood, for sure, just with their wings. But these birds basically held their wings still and moved their torsos so that they were able to ride the, the waves. And then they'd come back down, they'd chase each other, try to steal the sticks from one another and, and do this on and on. And it's not unusual to see these birds playing with different sorts of uh, toys like that. In this case, perhaps using them, but I've seen them at the Husky games. Uh, crows will fly over and they'll have a ball of paper or something and drop it. Another one will catch it and will fly up and drop it. And they'll basically play chase on and on uh, with that sort of thing. So I think it's very likely and, and, um, and very uh, expected from the sorts of things they typically do and where they're at and the sorts of toys that are available for them in those situations. So they, they surf, and as they're surfing, they're getting this brain full of uh, endorphins or natural opioids. And the other thing we've learned as we dig into how the brain handles this sort of pleasurable stimulation, not only are they getting opioids, they're also getting cannabinoids bonding in their, in their nerve cells. So basically what these animals are doing is the same thing as an addict would do if they were out shooting up uh, heroin and smoking pot at the same time. And so they're obviously they would be able to enjoy this sort of a situation uh, to the fullest. The last one I will tell you about, and then I will hope you will have some that can top these four stories, okay? That's your challenge tonight, things you've seen these birds do that are beyond this. The last one is about... Um, it also kind of brings home the notion of never discard an email you get from somebody that says these animals or the ice or whatever it is you study uh, did something unusual. So in this case, I got an email from Gary Clark, who lives in Marysville. And Gary said, um, I feed crows every day. And I get a lot of emails from people who feed crows every day. And Gary cuts a chicken, and he makes special sauce. and a, I mean, he makes seafood linguine that he would take out to these uh, birds in his backyard. He puts it out on a tray. Okay, no, nothing unusual there. I'm, he's got a lot of birds that come in. And one day he goes out and he says to the birds, I feed you every day and, and you never give me anything. And that afternoon on the little tray, of, you know, a TV dinner tray that he has out there is a small candy conversation heart with the word love on it. So I almost deleted the email. I held on to it, and I thought about it. I thought, well, okay, what, what, could, what else might be going on here? And uh, eventually I went over. I met Gary, and he's gotten a lot of gifts from crows. He's gotten a small iron butterfly. He's gotten cones. He's gotten 
uh, beads, uh, pieces of rock, all kinds of things left on that feeding tray that he leaves out for the birds, including the candy heart, which I did see and certainly had been through some, um, been through some trauma in its day. <laughs> and so we could think of many hypotheses that might explain this, just going through the basic scientific process. Well, okay, first, maybe Gary's just lying. He's just pulling my chain. And so uh, we went there and checked it out, and he seemed reasonable. His wife seemed reasonable. And, you know, the birds came right in when he put food down. And, I mean, this is clearly something he's doing. And then I got about eight other messages from all over the country of people also getting gifts from crows and ravens and magpies that they feed. They continually feed them in the same place, and they're left shiny objects. Or one, one woman got a blue Captain Crunch toy from these birds. So they've gotten some great things. And so the, the fact that many people have had the same experience suggests to me that he's not pulling my chain. Then I thought, well, maybe his neighbor was putting it out there or something, or his wife. But his wife's handicapped. She can't get out there. His neighbors are not thrilled at all about all the birds he attracts <laughs> into his yard. And so I don't think anybody else would put this uh, candy heart on there. And then maybe there's a squirrel. Well, that's possible. Or I think actually the most realistic thing is that it was a crow that left this heart on his tray. Now, I don't think the crow understood what the heart said and understood what Gary said because we have lots of other cases where things were exchanged that involved no writing or speaking. So I, I, I think that this is a situation that these animals do leave gifts, but whether we call them gifts, whether they view them as gifts or mistakes, I guess would be the, the question. And I can't really separate those two. I think in this case, the bird very well could have been carrying something that it found interesting in its environment around and reached down to get food and just dropped it and left it. And that's happened in many places. A woman in Seattle got a pair of keys or a set of keys that way from birds where she was feeding. All of a sudden, she heard a clink and looked, and boom, there was a set of keys. They were for a brand new uh, Mercedes, I believe it was. <laughs> <coughs> but um, she got a set of keys from these birds. So... It could just be they're carrying it for whatever reason, drop it because there's something more immediately rewarding, some food that they would take. Or it could be, I think it's possible, and we, you know, it's, it's worth thinking about. It's one of these things that pushes you to, to look at these animals a little differently. It could be their way of getting into our hip pocket, so to speak, and basically seeing this relationship. Hey, if I leave things here, they leave things for me. I leave more, maybe they'll leave more. And I don't think that's not a very complex relationship to really comprehend. And for an animal with a brain that's bigger for its body size than a lot of primates' brains are, it's not out of line for them to really be able to pull that sort of thought and connecting the dots, that associa associative learning. Uh, it's really not very difficult for them to pull off. So I think it's possible that it's a purposeful sort of way for them to to get more food, to keep a good thing coming in a particular area. But I can't prove that. But I, I think it's one or the other. I think it's real, and it's one of those situations. And when I talked with Wendy, she said, you know, that a lot of um, what they try to do, of course, at the Pacific Science Center and other places is to engage citizens in, in science and learning. And this is the kind of situation where an observation of that, of something like that seems so bizarre but when you pool it together and you get the same sort of observations from many people all over the world, uh, all of a sudden it starts to make sense. And it's very valuable for me as a scientist to get that sort of um, raw observation from, from people like yourself. So with that, I would certainly, uh, I guess we take a break now, but I'd welcome questions, uh, observations like that that you have had um, with these birds uh, after the break. I was surprised to, uh, you said of the seven crows that you follow, that many of them got uh, hit by car. And in my experience, it always seems like the crow gets away just at the last second, yeah. and I was really surprised to hear that. So, uh, Yeah, that's a, it, actually only one crow was hit by a car. The others were eaten by hawks, which is much more common. But these are, these are young crows. So the problem is the... The birds that do die, if you're a crow, it typically happens during that first few weeks to months or maybe in that sometime in that first year, but usually the first few weeks to months that you leave the nest. They can't fly very well at that time still. They're being cared for by their parents. They're dumb. They're learning about their environment, and that's when they have these issues. They run into cars or buildings or hawks catch them because they can. So that's what happened with that bird. That one that was run over is the only one that we had. 
We've had a few others over the years we've studied birds that have been run over, but it is very rare. They definitely know, an, an older crow really knows how to um, stay just long enough to get its the last bite and then get away. Yeah, for sure. I notice crows in our area uh, feed in the middle b between the yellow lines. Right. They seem to know that that's a safe place. Yeah, I think they learn those sorts of cues where it's where they don't get disturbed at all and other birds can't get to them there either. I had one story from a guy who was driving, uh, he said about 60 miles an hour down the interstate and drove right over a raven. And he thought, oh, I killed this raven. He looked behind him and the bird was like this, <laughs> crouched down. Just the car went right over it feeding in the middle of the road and in the next car did the exact same thing to it and it just it learned that that's a pretty risky behavior but it learned it <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it <laughs> um, when you talk about uh, bird brains you um, often people um, divided by body and I, I wonder if that is fair because, uh, I mean, in order to uh, to achieve thinking, I mean, we need some p brain, of course, because we have a lot of muscles that we need right. to coordinate. But uh, this kind of thinking needs different parts of brain, and it's not getting easier when you're smarter. That, that's right. And there are, there are many different ways to scale brain relative to body size or, or just absolute brain size. There's lots of different ways to try to get a fairly objective um, look at potential intelligence. And that's why they do that. But they've also, crows in particular, the whole family, the crows, jays, ravens, magpies, they all have very large forebrains relative to the rest of the brain, much larger than other animals. And that's really where the synthetic sorts of um, problem solving is occurring, uh, like our cortex of our, you know, our forebrain. Uh, that, that same structure in the bird, when we put, in the, put it under the MRI, last week, it's huge in the crow relative to um, other species, uh, finches and things like that. An awful lot of their brain is the midbrain and hindbrain portions, which are much more the control of motor function and coordination. And the real thinking and especially the integration of different sensory um, information that an animal gets as it moves to its environment, a lot of that's occurring in the forebrain. And and the memory and associative learning is occurring in centers in the forebrain. And those are areas that are extremely large in the, in the corvids and the parrots of the birds. They're by far the two groups of birds that exceed others in those um, dimensions. And then it's also correlated with tool using and innovative behaviors. You can do surveys of the published literature on you know, weird things people saw birds do, and most of those, well, a large proportion of those were seen within the crows and ravens and jays. So those, any of those different ways you try to sum it up, uh, there's this association between fairly large brained uh, birds and these complex problem solving abilities. But it's a really hard thing to get an objective measure of how smart a bird is, no doubt. I mean, I think they're all smart in different ways, but Crows are particularly good at remembering faces. Ravens are good at solving problems to get at food. New Caledonia crows are good at making tools. So they all specialize kind of in different cognitive dimensions. So I was just asked to come to this last night, and I would have never put two and two together, but last week, I swear this happened to me. I was on my porch, and I was feeding a squirrel, and the birds kept coming and taking it. And the next morning, the very next morning, I walked outside to walk my dog, and I walked under the same tree where these exact birds sit. And I don't know if it was the same bird, but it pooped on Probably. my head. <laughs> <laughs> does that have any, does it, no? It I don't know if it was the same bird, but it was a crow. What There's did you feed it? There's about four of them. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds weird because you said it, but I gave it peanuts because I was feeding the squirrel, not the crow. Yeah, well, they love peanuts. They should have done anything but poop on your head for sure. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's interesting, they, they, they do use that as a weapon, and usually they use it when somebody stops feeding them. Um, again, I, I'll just tell you another story about this, but in Sweden, uh, a woman fed magpies all the time, 
and they basically would come to her and they would they would never harass her they would wait for they'd in fact they would ring her doorbell <laughs> when they saw her in there to get her to come out and feed them but her husband didn't like him and he chased them and he shooed him away and they pooped on his car every day <laughs> just in front of the driver's uh, seat so I'm surprised they d I mean it was probably just I would say coincidence in your case where, where is the scientific community on um, people feeding the crows whether they should or shouldn't feed them yes yeah well it would depend on what scientific community you asked for sure I don't think there's a clear-cut answer, really. I mean, there are benefits to doing that, I think, in getting people to appreciate nature and engage in it and learn from it and maybe even experience these strange things that some of these animals do. There is a detriment to it if you increase the population size of the animals, I think. I, I'm not so concerned with taming them down. I think these animals basically tame themselves by living with us, that, that's their strategy to survive is to basically take us for all, we, all they can get from us. So I don't think we're doing them any disfavors by making them um, not so reliant but able to, to use us for food. I don't think that's a bad thing. But they, we could increase their population. If, enough, if everybody fed, fed birds, crows would get a lion's share of it, and their populations would skyrocket. And that could be a problem for other species, for sure, especially in that local area where they're concentrated around the food. We've done experiments with that, and if you feed them in an area, they will prey upon other nests of birds more in that area than further away because they, they just spend their time there. They get all the food they need in, in an hour or two, and they sit around and look the rest of the day and figure out, oh, what else can we take while we're here? So I, I think it could be a problem if it was done at a huge scale, but I think the scale at which a few people bond with these um, wild birds is probably more beneficial than harmful, um, but you know, there's no right or there's no right or wrong answer on it really. Every, every evening around uh, dusk, you see huge flocks of crows <laughs> going from the east side mm -hmm. to somewhere in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Is somebody over there feeding them, or uh, it, could you sort of explain? I mean, are they all families together, or just give me? some idea of what your thoughts are on that? Sure. What they do is they roost communally at every night. And so there are many places around the Puget Sound region. There's one over by the UW Bothell where they're spending a lot of time. There's one over at the marina uh, by Bellevue, uh, just on this side of the lake. There's one in uh, on the lake uh, by the university, which might have been the one you saw birds going to um, at Foster Island. And there's several around Totem Lake. There's many different places where they traditionally roost. And those are places that are relatively safe for them from predators. They're probably good uh, intermediate commuting spots where they can um, minimize their travel distances in a given day to, uh, to be able to roost there. So whether it's structured by families and neighborhoods and all of that, we don't know. But they do come in in flocks of you know, like 50 or 100 will come in as a squadron into these things. And I, what I don't know is, do they all leave together? We've had lots of radioed birds that move around between those different roosts, so we know they don't always go to the same place. It, it depends, but we don't know anything more about the structure um, of who's roosting with whom. Uh, yes, I have kind of a twofold question. In uh, present times or past, have crows and ravens and the like ever had migratory patterns? And when they find a place that has a good food source and everything, do they stay in that area? Or do they have a certain range that they use in their lifetime? So both crows and ravens are different in their spatial behavior like that. Um, ravens, typically the, the pair of ravens, they rarely have helpers if, if ever. It's usually just the pair. They mate for life. They defend a territory for life. And the size of that territory ranges from... Uh, maybe a few acres to thousands of acres, depending on how far away they are from reliable food. So if, they're, if they happen to have the territory next to the local dump, they will have a very small range and they'll, they'll stay there all the time and defend that vigorously from others. If they're far away from food, then they might even leave the territory for days and go and uh, feed at a, a reliable source like that. Or they go on bivouacs hunting and you know following hunters and eating the uh, leftover 
uh, intros from deer that they've shot and things like that for weeks on the time and then come back to the territory. But they have a territory that they defend and breed in and and the young ravens live in larger flocks, but they're completely um, mixed up all the time. They're, they're aggregations, they're not social entities. And they'll just happen to go to a place where the feeding is good and they'll stay there for as long as it's good and then they'll leave. And some will leave before others and they'll always be mixed up at the next feeding spot. And they share information about where that next spot is at their roost. So that's a little different than what crows do. Crows here, um, again, they have fixed territories and the adults are mated for life and they defend those territories from their neighbors, but they also wander widely from them and they go to wherever the feeding is good or wherever the communal roost site is that night and they all get together there every night. And, th and so they're a little bit different in that respect. Um, but they have very, the, the home range size and the consistency of use depends on how consistent the food is. It's all about food for these guys. So if you live in the city, you've got a few blocks of territory. And if you live out on the Olympic Peninsula, you've got hundreds and thousands of acres of territory as a crow that you have to um, use. Did I answer that question? Yeah. Um, I first just wanted to say I really uh, appreciated the stories that sure. you told and I wanted to add one of my own and then follow by question. Um, so it's just gonna be a quick story. Uh, one time when I went on this road trip through uh, Utah and Arizona, uh, I stopped at Bryce Canyon National Park and you probably know that any, anybody here who's who's been through there knows that there's some magnificent uh, sculptures out of you know out of rock that's been kind of hewn by the wind by the wind and uh, I was camping there overnight and there was you know some some of these amazing structures topped by snow that had just uh, freshly fallen and the, s the sunset was coming down and I was taking photographs and one thing that really struck me was the crows that were in there they were they were coming down into the valleys and and were just really just doing like one of the some of these like things out of maybe, I don't know, Top Gun or something. Right. They were just ravens. going, raven, ravens maybe, yeah. They Definitely. were they were just going through there and they were just enjoying, <coughs> they would be coming up and they were like diving back down again. It uh, didn't look like they were really after anything or, or would have been a really uh, <laughs> kind of a strange way to, to get after something. But but they, um, they really looked like they were having fun. They were surfing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I appreciated your surf story and uh, uh, and I'm going to share that with my surfer buddies yeah. back in California when I go back. So, um, I, but kind of on the topic of ravens, uh, they they have uh, there, there's this mythology that was established about ravens in North America as as kind of the, the mischievous uh, birds, trickster, sort of trickster, mm -hmm. right? So I'm I'm wondering if if there's a accounts that you've found or stories that that you that have caused you to um, follow up, follow this up in your research. Yeah, they're, um, they're viewed really two ways by Native Americans and actually Native people around the world. They're either the trickster um, or they are the creator, and, and often both. They are in most of the uh, Northwest Indian uh, legends, they're both. And, and I think it's uh, absolutely a reflection of how people were interacting with these birds in the wild. They're stealing their, I mean, a, a classic picture we have is of a macaw Indian uh, salmon drying rack. And built into that rack, is a scarecrow of the uh, that's in the likeness of the woman who was tending the rack, right? So these animals are being worshipped as their creator, which the macaw felt they were, the creator of, of their civilization and their world. And at the same time, they've got a scarecrow up to keep them away from their salmon because they're sneaking in and stealing their fish all the time. <laughs> so they're dealing with them on both levels. They worship them and revere them because of the amazing things they can fly and do all these amazing things. They disappear, they appear out of nowhere, all these sorts of things. But on the other hand, they're pests and they'll, they'll take your food the minute you give them a chance to. So um, yeah, I think both of those are direct reflections of, of what, what they experience those birds doing in the wild all the time. Well, the, I mean, the, the trickster part, we get a lot. So, oh, sorry, the question is, were there particular aspects of uh, raven biology that might have led us to investigate why they were uh, portrayed? Mythology. Okay, raven mythology. Well, two, um, the one, the, the gifting, uh, that we kind of, I mean, it's more the biology drove the 
ex exploration of culture to me because I'm a biologist. But um, basically the gifting example, there's a lot of legends about the raven bringing light or stealing this and, and this shiny object and taking it elsewhere, the uh, sun basically. So I think that could very well have been motivated by something like, um, you know, uh, the raven stealing, uh, it, well, for example, in Japan, they steal candles that are put out um, at grave sites because the candles are made of fat, tallow. And the same thing could very well have been happening around a lot of early uh, encampments is that people were using oil um, or fat as a source of fire and they'd see a raven flying off with it. Oh, hey, look at that guy. So they could, I think a lot of this could have been motivated by those natural experiences for sure. I got a, one observation and then uh, one question. Um, back about four and a half years ago, I rescued a crow with a broken wing and um, so I had it in a cage, and it was right up against our house because it was, you know, an overhang to protect it from the weather. And the house behind us had been sold, and the buyers were having their floors refinished. And so all the windows were open because of the smell, and lights were on, and loud radios playing. And for the first time, for the two days that that was going on, this crow, I used to line the bottom of the cage with a lot of newspaper, sheets of newspaper, and I would just take off the ones that were dirty and throw them away. This crow was taking complete sheets of newspaper and lining the side <laughs> of the cage <laughs> that was facing the noise and the light. And it did it just, just those two. Never done it before, never did it again. It was just those days when the noise and everything was coming. So to me, that's using tools. I mean, it's yeah. Oh, it, yeah. Was, it was pretty amazing. I mean, it was fun to watch him do it. And then the other, um, just at a park very close to here, I observed a crow with a really curved beak. And I was just wondering what... Know yeah, so that. so this curved beak or cross bill uh, phenomenon is is pretty common, and the the thing with bird beaks is that they're like fingernails; they keep growing unless you wear them down. So if they don't meet just properly, they will grow past one another and they will continue to grow. And the bird will will have problems; it might have a difficult time foraging, might die because it can't get enough to eat. But oftentimes they learn new ways to forage. Again, the the ability of having a big brain, they can adapt. And so they'll they'll get things from the side instead of straight on, but it's not uncommon to see that. There was some concern that it might be some sort of a um, of a of a uh, bacteria, and there was a lot of this uh, reported in Alaska and even some in um, around Bow, Washington. So I don't know the latest on that as a um, I if it has been traced down to any kind of um, natural pathogen. But I know it's also, I mean, it doesn't take much. The one neat thing about birds and the reason they have so many different shapes, bills, and that's one of the main ways they evolve into new um, environments, is that the, the shape of the bill is controlled by just a few genes, and a little bit of change in that produces a lot of variation, or a little bit of mismatch in development produces the ability of this, of this bill to look very, very different. So... In case anyone is wondering, the score is Auburn 19, Oregon 11. I was wondering. So when I was watching um, the murder of crows on PBS, uh, as I understood right, you're fu you were funded by the Defense Department? Yeah. And so what was their rationale for, for funding you? What information, what, could you give me, tell me what was happening with that? Yes, I can. <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, they were, um, it was, you know, I mean, anybody here who um, writes grants, um, you know, we, we try everything we can to, to get our research funded, basically, and, and you get turned down a lot. And one day, they, the military called me and said, we heard about this work you were doing with crows recognizing people, and uh, we're interested in that. What, what can you tell us about it? So I did, and they said, well, we need, we, we would like to have something like a crow that could go and find a missing person. Maybe it's a child that's missing. Maybe it's a soldier that's missing behind enemy lines. We would like to have animals like that that could go find them and report back to us. Maybe they could go find somebody who has a long white beard and wears, um, <laughs> you know, a more traditional <laughs> Afghani garb. <laughs> so they, I mean, basically they said, we want you to, c could you train ravens to go out and find these guys and come back to us? And I said, no, I can't do that. I don't, you know, I, I don't think they'll do that, and I don't really want to do that anyway. But uh, I'd be glad to figure out how much more, how many different kinds of faces they can recognize. Can they tell the difference between fine scale differences in faces and all that? So 
That's how that came about. They they wanted to be able to find missing people by show. Actually, they wanted to show them a photograph and have them go find them. Um, can you hear me? I yes, where are you? have um, two tales to share. Um, we were missing a quite elderly cat, and I was frantic for days. And it was summertime, early spring, and finally um, I noticed in walking around the neighborhood that um, the crows, a couple of crows, were fairly attentive. And finally, I, when one was on the street in front of me, I said, tell me. And that afternoon I heard quite a ruckus of crows, and I thought, they are trying to tell me something. And it persisted into the next day, and that's where our cat was. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is this summer, and we've had a bird bath for 18 years, and always the crows come sol alone, one at a time. And this summer, we had four um, young crows. They had all their um, fluff. Mm -hmm. They came together, and they um, got in the bird bath together. Constantly, for weeks. I, and um, one of the babies seemed to be quite um, plaintive, and the, and the m parent um, kept coming and feeding it, but they always returned together for, what, six weeks? Wow. I, it was, it was, is that, no, is that, I mean, it was wonderful. Well, but I mean, we'd never seen anything like that before. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that's, I think it's fairly unusual. Uh, I mean, they bathe all the time, and they just obviously found a really good, good place, safe place to do that. So um, they're going to take advantage of it all the time for sure. Um, why they haven't done it before, or I, I bet it will continue again. You know, if, if that pair is successful in producing young this year, uh, it'll continue again there. It's obviously it's a good, safe place for them to do that. So um, they have to bathe somewhere, and they're going to do it as a group like that for sure. So the, the cat thing is, is also pretty interesting. And I think what that shows is that some, for some reason, sometimes we pay closer attention to signs in nature. And you can learn a lot by doing that, of course. And I think in this case, you know, you just paid close attention to what these birds are doing. We, crows do not like cats. They're predators, of course, to crows. And so they're going to scold them, just like they're scolding me with my dangerous face when we catch them. They're scolding a cat as a potential danger in the environment. They're trying to get it to move. You picked up on it. You, for some reason, you were drawn to pay more attention to those crows on that time, and it paid off. And, you know, maybe the crow was signaling you, hey, I know if, if she comes out, we'll get rid of this cat because he's not leaving any other way. I mean, <laughs> that's th I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. But I also think a lot of it's just that we tend to, for whatever reason, we're motivated at some times to pay close attention. Maybe it's because we're missing a cat. Or maybe it's because somebody died. Some reason we tend to pay a lot more attention to some signals like that. Some of it's because it's deep in our culture to, you know, when something bad's happen, you think about crows and ravens, and you tend to pay attention to them. And they, le they do their normal thing, and it leads you to your cat. I think it's... It's pretty neat. Uh, over the new year, we have heard about some of these bird die-offs that were in the yeah. news. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have heard from conspiracy, conspiracy theories that the Russians were involved or the, or the <laughs> US Army did some tests, <coughs> or it's natural. Uh, it just happens, and it was more in the news than usual. Can you, as an expert, give us an idea of what might be behind it? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know firsthand, but what I've read and what I've heard um, from it suggests to me that it is a natural thing. And this time of year, when you've got severe weather um, sorts of events, birds are, in, in this case, the birds that died are all ones that roost together and flock together. So there's a lot of them in one place, first off. And then you have some unusual event. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe it is some natural weather thing where these birds were scared at night and flew up, got into high elevation, ran into things. A lot of the birds, I guess, in Arkansas had 
had collided with wires and things like that. They might have flown, you know, in a frantic way, and they don't see well at night, flown through a, uh, some hanging power lines, and a lot of them hit those. To me, they, they just fall right where the power line is, if that's the case. So I don't get that as the big – that can't be the explanation of a lot of those dead birds. I think they went very high in the air, maybe up some kind of a cyclonic wind, and froze or collided with uh, ice, you know, um, hail. And, and that, that can kill birds pretty darn quickly. And especially in wintertime, they're, they're maybe not in the greatest of health, and they get sucked up and something like that, and then they rain down over large area where it's not just in the immediate vicinity of things they ran into. So I think that sort of thing is likely. It's happened before. There were cold snaps that, that killed you know tens of thousands of birds in other places. Um, so I think it's I think that's the that's the working hypothesis right now. But it could have been that they got into some poison grain or um, some sort of food that had a natural toxin, botulism, or something like that. Usually more common with waterfowl than the birds that were killed. But it's you know those sorts of things do happen, and um, when they happen, and they happen in a place where people live, and they happen with a fairly big bird that's conspicuous. It's pretty alarming, but it, it happens a lot all over, and we just don't notice it. Uh, so I need to apologize. I don't have a crow question because somebody else took my crow question. <laughs> but I, I have a robin question that, that may, may fit uh, what you know about. I was um, in my office one day. I have a ground floor office and a low roof right outside the office. And I heard this noise on the window, and I pulled the drapes, and this robin kept on flying against the window and then land back on the roof. And then a few minutes later, fly against the window and mm -hmm. land back on the roof. And I thought, this is very strange. So I went out of the room, and it quit doing it, came back in the room, and started doing it again. I turned on and off the light. That didn't seem to have any effect. Finally, I went outside, and I went and just watched this raven, or this... Uh, Robin, and it would just look at me and uh, do its Robin head bobbing maneuvers, but it didn't fly against the window again, hmm. so I went back in, and it started again, so I just closed the drapes I was trying to concentrate. Um, I, I'm at a complete loss what that was all about. Well, it's weird that it was adjusting it based upon you being there or not. But it's pretty common for robins to do that, and they're seeing their reflection. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Oftentimes it is, um, and they just see it, at, you know, that reflection keeps moving when they move, and it's a territorial thing. So I've seen them do that to car mirrors. Uh, they've done it to my windows. Um, ravens will also do it. They've Ravens do it to car windows. If you place a mirror on the ground and a raven sees it, they'll immediately come up and start displaying to it like it's a territorial intruder. So they can recognize that um, image, that two-dimensional image as a bird, but it, it takes a while for them to recognize it as themselves. And some birds, magpies, um, if, if given enough experience with a mirror, do learn that that's me in that mirror, and they have a, a concept of self. But robins, um, I don't know if they would if you gave them enough time, but it would be – there's been quite a bit of work done on that. It would be interesting to do it with a greater diversity of birds and see uh, where, where that self-recognition drops off. So that's what I suspect is that it was defending its territory, but it's interesting. I haven't – I've never heard of a situation where it was so variable depending on whether you were in or not like that. So did you have red on? Did you have a red shirt on? I don't know. Hi. Thank you very much for coming and doing sure. this because it's really, really interesting. Um, can you tell me what the lifespan, the average lifespan of the crow is and what the outliers are? Yeah. Um, the average lifespan might be a couple of years. Most of them die when they first get out of the nest. And they, don't even, they don't even make it out of the egg. Most of them are eaten by raccoons or red-tailed hawks in the nest. And uh, those that get out and survive that first few years and get a territory, they're almost immortal. 
their mortality rate per year is about 1%. So uh, they can live for 20, 30 years, but not very many of them make it to that point where they have that sort of um, longevity. And uh, so I guess the outliers for crows are somewhere maybe around 30 years. Ravens, there's a report of one 70 years old that was a captive. But, you know, again, to know this from the wild, you have to have a bird banded at a known time, probably went left the nest and follow way through. We've had some of our birds are still alive that are over 15, 16 years old. So they have, they have long lifespans once they make it through that vulnerable period. We only have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, so who's had their hand up for quite a while up front here? Okay. Hi there. I was a biologist on the Valdez spell, and when uh -huh. we when we went out, we noticed that the ravens were stealing our film canisters, uh -huh. and we sent one of their grad students into the forest <laughs> to investigate. And there was a tree with the, the pile of lids underneath, so he scaled up the tree. And they had taken the film out of the canisters and woven it into their nest. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and just a, a secondary, um, I work with the Raptor Society, and we got a lot of hawks and eagles that flew into power lines. Uh -huh. but very few ravens. Yeah. And I was just wondering if their eyesight is more adept at. I, I don't think it's so much eyesight. I mean, it may be a little bit better at close objects like that, but I think it's probably more their flight style. I mean, a, you know, a raptor will lock on to something from a long ways out and, and just be focused in and not see anything else. And that's when they hit things like that. And a raven's always flying and looking, changing its head all the time, looking for something. So I think it's just more subtly using the environment. And they also, they're not, they, they know that range they're in. They know where those wires are. They probably nest on the power line somewhere, and they, they use it to their advantage. So I think it's more the behavior than the physiology probably. That's pretty interesting about the film canisters. I haven't heard of that. <laughs>